All right. Hey, everyone. It's John again from FMS. And today I'm joined again by Damon Wright. And we are going to talk about something that is not strictly the FTC cases that we've had recently, since we've talked a lot about that. Um, there is a new thing that's been happening in um, a lot of the internet marketing communities. Um, it's called class action lawsuits. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it across all kinds of things. Um, it is a threat and it's a threat that's easily, um, from my understanding, um, avoidable. Um, if you know about it ahead of time and kind of how to deal with it. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here with Damon today. Um, Damon also has, um, you guys remember we sent out, um, Gordon Reese, his law firm put out this huge kind of e-commerce guide um, on regulatory practices and things like that. And um, they have an updated one. And we're going to send that out because it includes a lot of stuff on this. Um, so anyway, with, with that, Damon, thanks for being here. Thank you, John. All right, so first, let's just like dive in real fast because um, there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, let's go through, um, to begin with, just for clarity's sake, when we say class action lawsuit, what specifically does that mean and what is it? Yeah, so a class action lawsuit is basically a case where there are hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of plaintiffs. And the way it starts is one person says, I am suing this company because of false advertising or because of I got a text message that I didn't consent to it or whatever it may be. I'm one person, I had this experience, but I'm suing on behalf of everyone else who's had the same experience. And it just means that in the complaint, there are some additional paragraphs that describe how this is widespread. Lots of people have suffered the same situation, same injuries, and it's more feasible, efficient to do this as a class. And so what happens then is at some point in the case, if it's not dismissed or settled, uh, the plaintiff moves for class certification and says, now, judge, I want you to find that this can be a class action because there are 50, 100, 1,000 people have had a similar situation. And, and now, of course, the defendant says, no, 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 this should just be in one single plaintiff case. But often, or not uh, uncommon, the judge grants class certification which now makes it a big class, which means the dollars that went from one person and you know, one person's purchase, maybe it was $1,000, now are exponentially larger. And there's certain elements that have to be satisfied to, to bring a case as a class action. But um, with internet marketers um, and financial publishers, uh, of course, there's, a, there's serious risk. We're seeing lots of cases around the country. Yeah, and I think the one thing that I remember you telling me that, that that I think is so striking about this particular type of litigation versus what we are used to thinking of as like, look, there were complaints that ended up from custom that basically were customer originated, right? Right, like you, you had a pissed off customer, um, they had complaints, they they, they sent a letter to somebody, they, they did something, it started it started with one of your customers being unhappy, which is something that we're comfortable with. What's weird or different or scary about class actions is class action lawsuits are a business model for some law firms, correct? No doubt. Um, and for yeah, for law firms and for some plaintiffs too. Um, there are firms that are dedicated to nothing but uh, sending out demand letters and filing complaints almost like on an assembly line basis, dealing with wow. uh, yeah, cookie uh, lawsuits, dealing with the idea that this website has communicated information about the consumer to a third party because the consumer signed up for Meta, Facebook years ago, and uh, or it could be again the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, text messages, email, um, website accessibility. There are people who are visually impaired, hearing impaired, who, and so you know the the Americans with Disabilities Act is an important act, but there are folks who have filed plaintiffs, five hundred, a thousand lawsuits, where they're always the plaintiff. And, it, and they always just happen to be coming across this website where they wanted to buy some random product. And, and, and it's, 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 you know, it makes you a little skeptical, right? So, um, so, you, so you basically have like a, a type of litigation that's originated essentially by professional and semi-pro Oh, yeah. Litigators. Yeah. And, and, and some of our community goes to uh, Trafficking and Conversion Summit, an affiliate summit. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a big business in legal leads. Those are class action lawyers that are trying to buy leads to bring class actions. Uh, you know, it's just another type of lead generation. So um, there are some folks that I meet that think that I'm there to buy leads because I want to do uh, roundup 
mass tort litigation or Camp Lejeune litigation or whatever the other kind of uh, big class actions are. But it's it's a real thing. We talked a lot about the FTC, uh, and that's an important thing. But class actions, the the cost of defense can be in the millions of dollars, and the consequence mm -hmm. can also, of course, be in the millions of dollars because you're talking right. about every single consumer that had this experience. Right. So that's that's, I mean. I don't know. It's so weird to me. I'm like, well, here's the thing: right, go vendors back. there selling class action leads essentially to lawyers at the biggest marketing conference in the in the industry if, for marketers. Yeah. Um, uh, it's such a it's such a bizarro world at this point. Um, can I can I, I don't want us to get depressed um, because there's a there's a solution. Is <laughs> a there's a lot that can be done very easily to fend this off, and um, you want to jump into it. Yeah, let's go. Like, what is it? Because that, that's that's why I wanted to do this is like, yep. it's like, here's this big threat, but it's actually a relatively simple or straightforward, I should say, way to, to make sure that this isn't a problem for you. So that's right. Let's go to it. What is it? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is what you were talking about at the opening. It's our e-commerce retailer legal guide. And I want to talk about a couple sections of this. The first one, obviously, one easy way to avoid class actions. We're going to talk about that. Then I want to talk about uh, subscription billing. There are class actions brought over companies, internet marketers not complying with subscription billing law. Then we want to talk about the uh, text and telemarketing. That's the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Then email marketing. There's a California statute called 17529. There are a lot of class actions brought under this statute. So we're going to talk about how to avoid litigation there. Then a different kind of cookie monster. There are these California Invasion of Privacy Act cases and federal wiretap cases that are really distorting the statute, but that's a big deal. And then website accessibility suits. And then maybe if we have time, I want to talk about business insurance. So these, if someone takes the time to read these sections or listen to this podcast or even better, both, you're going to be in a much better spot to not have to worry about class actions. And, and, and I'll, link that I'll, link I'll link that yeah. underneath here. So great for everybody. So, so let me, let me jump down to here. All right. This is one easy way to avoid class actions. So let's just uh, step back for a second. Um, so John, with a lot of class actions, people are walking into a brick and mortar store and they're buying something off the shelf. Um, with product or service sold online on your website, you have such a great advantage because you can easily form a contract with that consumer. Mm -hmm. If someone walks into Target or Walmart or a grocery store, LL Bean, whatever, they're they're not signing a, a contract. They're signing a credit card receipt, perhaps, but they're not signing a contract there at the store. But online, you can form that contract. And that kind of contract is called a click wrap agreement if the consumer has to check a box that says, I agree to the terms of sale, terms of sale hyperlinked. And inside the terms of sale, the secret thing, it's not a secret, but the, 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 the simple, easy thing to avoid class actions from people who have purchased from you that have gone all the way to the end and purchased is to have those terms include a class action waiver. And also often a mandatory arbitration provision. So it's not, the case will also not be public. It'll be an arbitration. I can't tell you um, how, how easy that is. It's such a simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. But right now there are lots of businesses selling products and services online that don't have that. Right. I mean, it, that's, I mean, that seems pretty straightforward. Oh, it's super of... basic. It's so basic. Yeah. Um, so we explain here, imagine that right now a litigious opportunistic consumer is diligently searching the internet. He goes from one e-commerce website to the next. At each, he doesn't stop to study the product images or features. He doesn't care about the product, the product claims or the testimonials, but he knows what he wants to find. He keeps moving his mouse, clicking the hyperlinks, visiting the checkout page and scrolling down the website terms. So this is a guy who's a pro se plaintiff looking in the middle of the night to, to find a target. He's hunting on the internet. Halfway through the terms, he frowns, but he clicks away, goes to the next website, and keeps searching. He knows what he wants to find. 
He knows he'll find what he wants soon enough. And finally, he hits pay dirt. He's found an e-commerce website that does not have a click wrap contract, a mandatory arbitration provision or a class action waiver provision. He buys the most expensive product on the site, then takes a lunch break. He's going to start working on his class action lawsuit in the afternoon. That, that's based on a very common fact pattern. Um, so what we describe here is about, again, I agree to the website terms of sale. And I've had clients that have told me, oh, I think it might hurt conversion to have a checkbox, an unchecked checkbox, and it needs to be unchecked. Um, another, I've said, I've had clients, countless clients have told me it doesn't hurt conversion a whit, that people are filling out their name and their address and their credit card number. And they're not suddenly going to go, whoa, 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 what's this box? What does it mean? Website terms. Mm-hmm. That's just not reality. It's yeah. not as ironclad, but if you if someone is really not excited about the unchecked checkbox, an alternative is to have language above the button that says, by clicking buy below, I agree to the website terms. Um, there are some outlier cases that say that's not enough. Uh, you basically need the, the checkbox to, to sort of approximate the signature of someone to a contract. That's the affirmative action they're taking mm-hmm. to agree. So okay. this can really this can really insulate a business from, again, um, people who've actually bought the product. There could be class actions from others who haven't, who've right. just visited so, the site. So that's pretty, I mean, so like, I mean, that's, that's really the threat right there, right? Is that there are people who are out there going through websites um, looking for whether or not they... They know what they're looking for, right? Because they're not going to waste their time. So that they're looking at the, they're looking at the terms and is there a class yep. action waiver? Is there the other thing? And if not, then they're going after and doing things. And so, the reason I think this is important right now is you know we we I went back and looked. We were about two and two years ahead of the FTC kind of stuff coming into the space when we had brought some stuff to the FMS about like, hey, this is kind of a threat. Um, and you could tell there's threats because they're happening in larger internet marketing communities, like class actions are happening now. Um, and with the issue of, of financial information products going more mainstream that we've been talking about mm-hmm. for the last two years, I think that this is an area that eventually, maybe in the very near future, we're going to start to see some kind of actions. And so like, yeah. it's always easier to, to deal with it by fixing it now before somebody attacks or goes after you than it is fixing or dealing with the case afterwards. And so oh, it's so much cheaper. Yeah. That's why we, we thought this was important to do right now. Yeah. Um, and why yeah. it's like, hey, pay attention to this. This is this is a simple thing that can prevent a hell of a lot of headache and a hell of <laughs> yeah. a lot of fines and a hell of a lot of problems later. That's exactly right. Now, um, a couple thoughts. The, the Shopify template doesn't have the unchecked checkbox language. Hmm. You have to work to to make to add it. It's um it's kind of, it should be there. Um, at FMS, there was a, a fellow who did a great presentation on split testing. Mm-hmm. And um, and put up a checkout page, and I I really I didn't want to be that obnoxious guy, but I really wanted to point out that there was one thing missing from that checkout page. Uh, you're talking about trying to tweak conversion with split testing ever so slightly, but that you also want to make sure you're able to keep the money you've made. So, um, <laughs> right? Very important. Very important. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let me let me go now to an area where there are a lot of class actions. Now. If you have the click wrap, you should be able to avoid this type of class action, but nevertheless, it's it's important to be aware of this. And that's, especially for this, our community. This has to do with subscription billing. Uh, this hypothetical here talks about uh, cigar of the month subscription business. And people are you know getting the same product month after month. But you could just as easily say it's the, uh, Financial FinPub company Blitz Alert trade alert service. It's being sold on a subscription. And I think most of, of the folks in the FMS community are selling their products, their, their digital products on subscription. Mm-hmm. So let me just cover what's needed if you're selling a product on subscription. Um, it, it really, it starts with three things uh, that are very basic. Uh, one is that there has to be clear and conspicuous disclosure of the subscription billing terms. So how much people are going to pay each month mm-hmm. when they have to cancel. 
All right. Two is the consumer has to provide express affirmative consent to those terms. So again, back to an unchecked checkbox is often the best way to do it. If it's so obvious this is a subscription and you're not offering a one-time purchase of something, um, there's a good argument that the consumer is providing express consent by just completing mm -hmm. the transaction. But that's the second thing. And the third thing is the, the, the business has to provide a simple and easy mechanism to cancel the subscription. And there's a federal law called ROSCA that the FTC enforces that stands for the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act. It, it requires those three things. But wait, there's more. Uh, uh, there are state statutes that are very much like ROSCA, except they actually require more than just those three things. And that's where, in the last couple of years, it's gotten complicated. Hmm. There's a California statute. Uh, there is a Vermont statute, uh, there's a Virginia statute, there's a DC statute, there's a North Dakota statute. And those statutes have some wrinkles. And I won't go into it in, in great depth here, um, but I encourage, I encourage folks to read this because the, the in Vermont, you have to have two separate check boxes, one for the terms of sale and another just for the subscription billing terms. Uh, in California, you have to have a click to cancel button. So mm -hmm. someone can go online and cancel like that. Or you have to have this pre-formatted email that uh, someone can, if they receive an email confirming their subscription, they can just click a link in that email to go to an email that then would be sent to the business to say, I want right. to cancel. So there's been a real emphasis on uh, by regulators to just prohibit save the sale efforts as well um the, that's the this yeah. is like the this is definitely the the, the dynamic right like everybody yeah. who sells stuff wants to create friction in the cancellation process because right. it helps save money and, and and the regulators in the states want to reduce friction in the process and so do all with all these different kind of state regulations um is it something where like there's one basic pattern that covers all of them. Yeah, the common like, denominator. Yeah. Yeah. Or is yeah. it something that like, oh my God, I have to actually track what state state to keep covered? Because that's almost like untenable for a small business. I know. Yeah. Um yeah. The, Ver Vermont. It's funny. I mean, you don't think Vermont's like a big regulatory, uh aggressive regulatory state, but Vermont and California. Uh, both have quirks. Now, if you wanted to take the common denominator test uh, approach and satisfy both those quirks and do that for all 50 states, you could do that. Um, if you want to try to geo-target, so you send this type of confirmation email to California consumers, and you have this type of checkout page for Vermont consumers, you could also do that. But that's that's a technological challenge. Yeah, that's that's definitely harder <laughs> yeah. to do. So yep. I think yep. people are looking for what, what's the, what's the one simple fix if I do yeah. it that, that that covers me rather than trying to spend. I mean, some of the some people might have the dev abilities and, and strong dev team in house that they can go ahead and geo target and things like that. But I think yep. most people are not going to be doing that. No, I agree. No, and I think um, a lot of businesses are not complying with the Vermont statute. Um, it's it's again it's it's having an extra checkbox. That's that's the big thing. Um, mm -hmm. That, that separates out the billing terms in its own statement. Um, there are a lot of businesses that are applying the California approach to the one click to cancel the pre-formatted email. And the FTC has uh, is probably going to require that as part of a new rule coming down soon. Um, mm -hmm. So the idea that to cancel um, you're on hold and you dropped off and they have to talk to their supervisor and then they you know, they try to downsell you, downsell you, downsell. You. I know people that do that and get great deals on XM radio, um, but um, that's the concern. And so they want to make it, if you're able to buy something online in a matter of seconds, you should be able to cancel it in a matter of seconds. That's the concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, let's talk about. Uh, oh, just one, one thing. So yeah, you're right. saying there have already been cases around these things. Oh, yeah. 
class yeah. action cases? Yes. Hundreds. Hundreds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Enjoy. big names like like vitamin shop um right spotify i mean you know yeah 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 well, i mean that's the thing so when just to back up and and i want to keep it moving but um there's got to be a certain size of company that people are going it, after right um or no i said hundreds i really should have said tens of thousands actually oh. um, yeah yeah tens of thousands yeah Okay, so they're going after um, everybody that they can, and just yeah, but kind of just shaking the tree and seeing what falls out. Yeah, and and yeah, I mean to go back to your point, yes, they are going after companies that a plaintiff's lawyer wants to try to figure out what's going to be my biggest bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. um, if I can put in five hundred hours and bring a case against a company that's doing a billion dollars and win, that's going to get me more money than five hundred hours in a case against a company that's doing five million dollars. Mm -hmm. right? um, so, yeah. Wow. But the you, here's the thing. Um, we talked about the click wrap in the website terms. If you have that in place, you should be uh, able to avoid the class action for violating subscription billing laws because it would be brought by someone who already completed that purchase who agreed to the class action. You could still get sued individually but and then you can you're still getting problems with yeah, and you can get problems with regulators right. too, right? right. But, but, you're, um, but you're looking at like I got to refund this one guy, right? Um, it's a much different situation. Happy, it's a much different situation than that's right. Hey, yeah. we're going to go after everybody and send out because don't you have to send out if, if you have a class action judgment against you? Don't you have to send something out to all of your customers that they can yes. like participate in that? That's right. So like you get to go and a lot of and a lot of class actions. Them. Yeah, and I should have said this before. A lot of class actions settle. Hmm. Um, but they settle by requiring notice to go to all the class members and it's every single class member gets uh, $25 or a coupon and the plaintiff's lawyers get a success fee of you know $2 million or something like that. And, and if every single class member uh, took advantage of that offer, you know, the total amount paid out could be in the millions of dollars, you know, say 10, $15 million. Mm -hmm. But what happens so often is the take rate, is closer to five ten percent people mm -hmm. are like oh i don't know what this postcard is looks like i get 10 bucks if i send it in and it goes in the, in the right. trash right so the the ultimate payout ends up being five million instead of 10 15. right but that's why there's that's why it's a business model because the lawyers are going to get their two million or or whatever yeah yeah yep. yep. or or it could go all the way to trial and plans look lawyers could lose or they could mm -hmm. win if they win they get a judgment and then that process starts yeah all right. Um, let's talk about this is an area where there's been a tremendous amount of activity. Um, I want to talk about um, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Mm -hmm. So this is the law that applies to um, text messages, SMS, or pre-recorded voicemail, artificial voicemail or robocalls. Uh, a few years ago, there was a US Supreme Court decision, uh, DeGuid versus Facebook. And it had to do with what the definition of an automated telephone dialing system was, uh, kind of like a robo dialer. And the Supreme Court, in a 9-0 opinion, said the definition in the statute is really, really narrow. And because it's so narrow, these Telephone Consumer Protection Act cases that have been being brought for the last many years should not have been brought. Those those defendants weren't using an ATDS because the statute says an ATDS is a technology that's calling numbers that are randomly generated. And if the numbers are stored, not randomly generated, it's not an ATDS. All right, so it was a 9-0 decision and the business community said, yay, Awesome. We're not going to face these TCPA cases like we did before. Um, you could still get a, get sued if if you were uh, if a person was on the do not call registry, all right, and you didn't get consent. But just mm -hmm. the you know I was annoyed because I got this kind of case. All right. So anyway, business community celebrated. 
and he, just the opposite thing happened. Rather than there being fewer cases, there end up being many, many more cases. And the reason is because the state legislatures saw the Supreme Court decision and said, uh oh, we better jump into this. We better fill the void. And suddenly, several states passed their own mini Telephone Consumer Protection Act statutes that defined the ATDS technology in the broadest way. Does that make sense? So, yeah, it, yeah totally. it, what, what everyone predicted happening was counterintuitive, just the opposite happened. So, and class actions. So, uh, that, so I want to take a, I want to take a break for a second here and just put a resource out there from, uh, Zach Westfall, who, who spoke down at, um, FMS this year on, cause they, they are one of the phone sales is one of their big things, right? Yeah. Um, and one thing that he, 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 he shared with me was that he uses dnc.com dot com. yeah which yep. is do not call.com basically there's the first in letters so the letter d is in dog n is in nancy c is in cat.com and it scrubs against the do not call registry your phone your numbers it's and known litigators and i think um, um government agencies too um but i'm not sure about that but i think known litigators and um uh, people who have said do not call. Uh, so if you're doing outbound phone sale or doing phone sales, if you're doing text messaging, because um, do not call applies to text too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So then you need to be scrubbing. And if you're not scrubbing, then you can almost guarantee that in some form you're, you're, you're in violation if you're using SMS. And SMS is very important these days because we're seeing conversion rates on SMS um, to our list going up. Um, and being a, an, an increasingly significant part of sales. Um, and so uh, that's a big thing. DNC.com for anyone who's not using it. Yep. Yep. I, I recommend them. Um, so yeah, the back to class actions, uh, one person gets a couple text messages they did not want. Uh, they didn't provide prior express written consent to receive text messages, marketing text messages. And what happens next is they file a class action on behalf of everyone. And I'm looking at something right now that 58.1% uh, of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act cases filed last year were filed as class actions. So, you know, just Yay. one person received one person receiving a few texts suddenly it becomes a case where they're saying everyone who received these texts. Uh, I've seen a, a, a situation with some really great, smart, organized clients mm -hmm. who in one way were not so organized where someone will reply stop, a consumer will reply stop and they'll get a response back saying you've been removed. But they have that same phone number in this list or that list and that other list and they're using maybe a different texting platform. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have a master unsubscribe, master suppression. So that consumer a week later gets another text from the same business from a different sending phone number. And now they say, I wasn't suppressed. You didn't honor my stop request. Right. So, and, and it turns out that the company needs to quickly consolidate their list and scrub. And, uh, and it's a, it's a, you know, really a big problem. If they, yeah. and, and someone just was not paying well enough attention, but this discussion here um, in, in the guide talks about how to avoid these kinds of cases. Um, under the TCPA, the penalties can be up to $1,500 per text. Um, the key thing is to get prior express written consent for any kind of marketing text messages. And that's the language that looks like this. I agree to receive automated calls, text messages, and pre-recorded messages via an automated dialing system about promotions from or on behalf of at the telephone number I provide, understand consent's not a condition of purchase. That's it. You don't need to have this language if someone is um, receiving order updates and it's about their purchase. But the moment you start talking about and get a 10% discount on your next purchase, mm -hmm. now it's gone from transactional to promotional. Okay. And there's an argument that unless you have this express consent, you could be liable. And it's an issue, not just, it's not as much of an issue under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the federal law, unless someone's on the do not call registry, then you do need this. 
but it is an issue under all these state statutes, kind of like we were talking about the subscription billing. You've got now um, New Jersey, Washington, New York, Maryland, uh, nice. Florida. Uh, it's a patchwork. And so... Did that's, you mean that's... that if... So just to go back a second, did you mean that if a customer... Let's say I have a customer who's on the Do Not Call registry. Yep. Am I allowed to text them or call them about their order? Yes. Those yes. are fine. So even yes, that would, do not, okay, I just want to be clear. That would, that would be transactional. Right. Okay. As long as it's transactional. But any, but so basically like phone and SMS do not follow what you would think of as email kind of stuff, right? Just because they, um, they are a customer doesn't mean you can send them whatever because you're a customer. That's right. That's right. You have to have specific permission basically, or they could, they could opt out not on your website from all calls and then you're legally required to abide by that do not call registry that happened outside of your business relationship, but they have it there. And unless they give you express permission specifically to opt into phone stuff, you can't do anything. For it. From uh, any kind of marketing promotional stuff. Right, and no marketing. No marketing. Right, right. Yeah. And that, and that's a consequence of, um, and it's a, bit, it's a bit confusing, but if you read the guide, it'll, it'll make more sense. But um, you need that to the extent that uh, someone's on the do not call registry. You need that to avoid liability under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the federal act. Um, if someone's on do not call and you don't have that consent and you send them a promotional text, mm -hmm. you're liable. But then on all these other state statutes, you could be liable for sending a promotional text to someone whether or not they're on do not call. Does that make sense? I mean, it does. It doesn't make me happy. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so how do you how do you manage with all the states? Because again, same issue. Um, well, DNC.com. Uh, so they scrub states too. The state stuff. Yeah, the, the state. There are state DNC registries. Um, and and then again, am I sharing my screen now? I'm not sure if I am. You're not currently. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, how do you manage the states? I mean, this is there. We go. This is it. I mean, there are some other things about when you can call, when you can text. Uh, if you're calling, uh, there are state particular statutes about how quickly you have to identify with a company you're with. Uh, and of course, you need to let people know if you're recording the call. But this is this is the magic language. Okay. So yeah. again, relatively simple solutions. Yeah. They do increase friction in certain, in certain points. And that's, you know, something that that's you right. just have to deal with. Now, you know, a big issue is uh, if you're doing some type of um, data monetization, and you're buying someone else's list. You could be walking right into a bunch of TCPA lawsuits or a class action lawsuit because the consumers didn't give consent to you to tax them. Right. Uh, so. If you're not buying the business that has the consent. And there, I mean, we, we have this different, we, we get this in waves. It's been a while since we've had kind of a big push of people selling lists. And stuff yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, um, if it's a, if it's a business sale, certainly if it's a stock sale, uh, but most likely if it's an asset sale, it's going to depend on the language of the privacy policy mm -hmm. too, that people sign up for. But um, yeah, just don't, don't say, Hey, give me your list. I'll give you my list and off the races right. for, for any kind of texting. Yeah. So. All right, let's talk about something that's similar but different. And that is email. So the workhorse. Yeah, yeah. So um, with email, you don't need to have consent to send a marketing email. You do need to comply with the Can't Spam Act. Mm -hmm. And and then there are, of course, state statutes, of course, California that are kind of like mini can spam act cases. So this discussion talks about what to do there. And it's most of it's pretty much common sense. You know, you can't use deceptive subject lines. You have to identify it as an ad. You can't have misleading header information. I mean, uh, deceptive, pretty straightforward. The, the subject line thing though is kind of like, that's one of those things that like, based on the type of emails and stuff that we send, I mean, I guess, I guess you're saying that the whole like social security says as if you're coming from social security yeah. with a sender, but like, I mean, that's such a vague thing. Like subject lines are so 
Yeah, you want to get someone's attention. Day. Right. 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 Uh, you know, your car warranty has expired. Um, Stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Um, let me let me single out one thing that's causing problems uh, and leading to a lot of lawsuits right now. You know, including for some people in the FMS community. They've dealt with this. Some got clients who dealt with this in the past. Have clients who are facing this now. Um, with any kind of email that's sent, marketing email, the sender is supposed to be traceable by the recipient. And what that means under the California case law is that you say, John, you get an email and you want to find out, okay, who sent me this email? This case law says you should be able to click uh, the domain mm -hmm. uh, or the sending domain. And, and, you know, and does that take you to a website that says, here's this company, here's where they're located. Here's the official company name. All right. That's one way you could figure out who the sender is. Another way would be if you look at the footer of the email and it would have a company name and an address, and it's got to be the real company name and a real address that would tell you who the sender is. Um, another, um, another way could be, um, Actually, those are the two biggest ways. Uh, so, the two biggest ways. Yeah. yeah uh, and so, so often, uh, FinPub companies are using publishers or uh, who are sending out emails, and the domain doesn't lead to a website, or the domain, if you search it on who is, it says domains by proxy. So you can't use the domain to figure out who the sender is, what their real company name is, what their address is. And then if you go to the footer, it's some type of DBA. It's some PO box and it's in a state, but there's no way to show up at the PO box and find out what the real company name is. Mm. And the DBA is just something catchy. It's not, it's not the real company name. And so what happens then is the, the advertiser is liable for the acts of the publisher. Mm. The publisher, mm. uh, you know, didn't know any better but they can create massive liability for the advertiser. And there's some law firms that have specialized in this type of litigation, simply saying the sender's not reasonably traceable, therefore the advertiser's liable, and it's up to $1,000 per email. And of course, there are tens of thousands of emails that right. were sent. So the fix is to make sure the company that's the sender is identifiable, uh, real company name in the footer, real address, and if you search the Secretary of State business records in that state, mm -hmm. you should be able to find that company, right? They, they need to be registered in that state. Okay. Yeah. Did, did that all make sense? So that's interesting. So like, it's it's not just like, hey, here's my my domain name. It's down to the registered registered uh, registered entity in the state that you're saying your your site. That's right. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So this is what um, <clears throat> we're saying here. You can be exposed to liability even if you've engaged an email marketing company to send emails on your behalf. The sender, not just the advertiser, needs to be readily ascertainable or traceable. And so it's common for an agency or network to send an email advertising a product from a privately registered domain. While they disclose the identity of the advertiser in the body of the email, the sender is never identified and consumers are unable to locate the entity responsible for actually sending the email. So, so basically, if, if, you have, if you have an agency or a, that, that is sending stuff for you or you, have a, you advertise somewhere and they put your ad in a list where they are not compliant with this, yes. then in your, and you are findable. <laughs> They can't find exactly. them, so they can find you, so they're going to go ahead and, and find you instead of because they can't find them. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So what we're yeah. saying here is um, email marketing companies should use a publicly registered domain name or identify themselves by a full legal name and properly registered postal address at the bottom of each email. The sender's corporate name, including any DBA contact information, for match, should match what's on file in mm -hmm. the state where the email marketing company is authorized to do business. Yeah. 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 Well, I think we're thankful that a lot of our larger groups that, that do email, have email networks are pretty, 
pretty good operators at this point, but there's a lot of small people out there who are selling stuff and doing stuff. And, you know, you, you find yeah. any and all types of problems um, in terms of just like this kind of like logistical stuff that maybe they're not aware of. And yep. So yep. everyone be, be aware of it again, why we're kind of doing these things. All right. Let me go to another topic here. Um, this is, The last year and a half, uh, this has become the new favorite kind of claim brought by class action lawyers. Um, and I, I like the title, a different kind of cookie monster. So was I, I think I was sharing my screen there just now, wasn't I? Nope. I'm just talking to myself. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Back in uh, the, the, I think, late 60s, or early 70s, um, the California legislature maybe watched some James Bond movies or something like that, and suddenly we were concerned about the idea that you could have a, a microphone, a recording device, and a martini olive uh, toothpick or, or whatever, you know, on your lapel, eavesdropping it was the concern. And so they passed the California Invasion of Privacy Act. And basically saying it's illegal to record someone um, without their consent. And California is a two-party state uh, for purposes of phone calls. So if you're on a phone call with someone in California and you're recording it and they don't know it, you could be liable. Um, and there are a couple, there are several other states that are, are two-party consent states like that too. So statute was intended to deal with being, you know, someone being recorded without their knowledge, uh, maybe James Bond style or something like that. Uh, Years later, 2022, 2023, 2024, creative plaintiff's lawyers say, I think we can use this statute to say that when a consumer visits a website and the website's collecting information about them, just by virtue of their arrival at the site, and then that information gets communicated to others, that that violates this California Invasion of Privacy Act statute. Down to the ridiculousness of website has a chat box feature. Consumer goes to the chat box, says, I'm interested in, in learning more about your products. Chatbot says, oh, okay, well, let me tell you more. If that chat box feature is actually owned and operated by a separate company that has the data, plaintiff's lawyers are saying that also is illegal wiretapping, use trapping recording without their consent, unless you have a privacy banner or a cookie banner. So these are ridiculous cases. Um, the, this is why people hate lawyers. I know. People who come, these guys who come up with this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I know. Uh, so uh, it's it's ridiculous. Um, and this is probably the sort of shortest section we have in the guide, but um, a cookie banner consent is is really the key thing. If you can say establish there's consent, then uh, these cases are over. So, so that's like the GDPR like pop ups that everyone's kind of got at this point. I hope most people do. That's, that's right. But that's right. Yeah. Um, just for reference here. Um, Yeah, the, there have been thousands of cases brought under this California Invasion of Privacy Act case. Um, thousands. Thousands, yeah. And a lot of arbitrations, too. So the uh, most of this is happening out in the, in the California courts. Some is happening in the Florida courts. Um, it's, again, a simple fix, though. Mm -hmm. And being able to say that the consumer consented to any recording at the outset um, basically eliminates that issue. So, all right, let's go to uh, one more topic and that's website accessibility lawsuits. Um, you've spent 
months developing your website, the enrollment paths and checkout pages, and invested tons of money in copywriters and campaign managers to help you market and sell your products. Your new website's beautiful. You've split tested ads, dialed and everything. Now it's time to sit back and relax. And then you receive a demand letter. The letter says your website is insufficiently accessible by the firm's visually impaired clients. And your beautiful new enrollment path wreaks havoc with end user screen reading software. And the lawyer demands that you immediately remove the barriers to access and write a large check to avoid a class action for violating the Americans with Disabilities Act and state and local accessibility laws. So this is common. The just like wheelchair ramps and uh, other other kind of brick and mortar features of the Americans with Disabilities Act, allowing people to be able to visit places of public accommodation, courts for the most part have held that websites are places of public accommodation. And therefore people with various disabilities should be able to have access to these websites. The, the case law is uh, around the country is uh, not consistent. Some places, some courts have held that websites are not places of public accommodation and they're not subject to these laws. Other courts have said in other parts of the country, yes, they are. Um, but again, it's unless you're going to sort of geo target, if you're going to be liable in half the states or two thirds of the states, you might as well comply and provide the same access across all the states. Unlike the other things we've talked about here, there is not a legal hook or legal solution to these problems where you add some language to your site and you've right. suddenly reduced your liability or exposure tremendously. This is instead a technical issue um, or a technological issue. And what it means is that you should, if, if your business um, doesn't, if you have a website and you're, and you're receiving traffic to your website, you should work with a consultant or a really good website designer to make sure that you're complying with the web content accessibility guidelines. And you should make sure your consultant, your website designer understands what these guidelines require. And it really has to do with making sure that the website can integrate with um, software that hearing impaired, visually impaired, other people with impairments that they use to be able to access the internet. And these are the requirements for the website formats, uh, perceivable, operable, understandable, robust. And so again, not a, not a legal solution. Here's all you need to do to really reduce liability. It's about working with someone very knowledgeable on how to make sure you comply. Um, for a while, uh, and to some extent still, um, there are companies that say we have a plugin and just pay us the license fee for our plugin and you're going to be pretty well protected against these kind of lawsuits. Um, the plaintiff's lawyers have argued more and more that those plugins aren't sufficient and they actually create a worse user experience. And so whereas three years ago, we could represent a client and say, look, they have this software and maybe the plaintiff's counsel would say, all right, I'll, I'll settle for $10,000. Now we say, we have our client has the software and plaintiff's counsel says, well, that just makes the problem worse and my demand's gone up. <laughs> Most of these cases settle, um, but just to give you a sense of things, um, 2023, uh, there are approximately 4,300 of these lawsuits filed around the country. And um, in 2023, 77% of these lawsuits were filed against businesses with under $25 million in revenue. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that sucks. So, so we're going to um, we're gonna have to the small guys. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's probably, they figure, for settlement in the sense, like, everyone's going to try and settle because they don't want to deal with this and yeah, that's the thing. It can be really frustrating. That there are plaintiff's lawyers who, there are some who are real zealots and are. It's a, I'm I'm going to um I'm a you know a warrior and I'm going to go to the mat and try to do everything I can to 
to make as much money for mm -hmm. the people that I represent and create as much good in the world. And that's, that's their one mentality. Another mentality is I'm going to um, just go after lots of companies and make it a settlement demand that's less than the cost of defense. So if it's going to cost a half a million dollars to settle this, to, to litigate this case and the defendant knows it, I'm going to start my settlement negotiations at $250,000. And they'd be stupid not to take it because even if they win at the end of the day, if we litigate and they win at the end of the day, they will have spent twice that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that other kind of approach. Um, so. Hmm. One, one more section to, to talk about. Don and uh, if you have a couple yeah. more minutes here, yeah, yeah, just a few more, and then we're coming up on a yeah. deadline here in a minute. So. All right, so let's um, th this is a section about the benefits of business insurance, and uh, yeah, I think it's every every business should make sure that they've got insurance, and some of the types of claims we've talked about, um, you can get insurance to, to help yeah. with the cost of defense or cover the claim. Yeah, that's something you use a certain size, it starts to become economical in terms of the risk reward on that. Um, and I think this is like, you know, this is all the stuff that like, you know, nobody wants to nobody wants to take the time to think about because it sucks. It's not about making money. <laughs> but it's about, like you said, keeping the money that, you know, and I'd much rather do a lot of these conversations with you, Damon, than a lot more of those conversations with people who are like, hey, let me tell you about my experience in um, over the last two and a half years dealing with this major lawsuit that I had to deal with that cost me millions of dollars and shut down my business. Um, those conversations suck. Everyone wants to pay attention to those because they're so interesting in like, holy crap, let's hear what happened. Yeah. Um, but much better to have these conversations so that you're not that case study. Nobody wants to be that case study. I don't want you to be that case study. I don't want to do any more of those episodes. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to do any more of those episodes with people from the community. So I know, um, like everybody, like pay attention to this stuff. It's you know, it's not you know, it's 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 easy to get like distracted from it and be like, hey, this isn't something I can deal with right now because I got a campaign going out today. But somebody should should be going through this guide and going through these things and talking to Dame and other you know, and just like get this stuff handled so that you're not a future case study please yeah yeah i mean the the, the e-commerce legal guide i think i told you before we started in 2019 mm -hmm. probably a thousand hours of legal work that's gone into that uh so that's you know at our rates that's that's a lot of money uh that's and it could save you it could save you and help to make you millions of dollars there are other sections we didn't talk about um so there's a lot of value there and we're, we're giving it away for free and the things we're talking about there are things that you can implement to avoid having to pay lawyers and having to pay others a lot of money. We actually make my law firm more money when people haven't done that kind of stuff we've talked about here, and then they get sued, and then we're we're in the thick of it. Um, but so it's like maybe it's against interest. But I'd like to help clients grow and sleep well and make a lot of money, and uh, certainly we we litigate and uh, fight for our clients when necessary in court. But yeah, it, a lot of this is pretty simple and it can, it can help you in a huge way. That's awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to link to that awesome. guide, everybody um, download it, read it, pass it to whoever you need to on your, on your team uh, to read it. Um, I'll link to the DNC uh, as well. The do not call scrubber. Um, and Damon, thanks for taking the time and doing this. And thanks for you guys putting that guide together and everybody check it out. Thanks, John.